It's eight o'clock. I think there will be other people joining as well, uh, but um, let's just uh, start because otherwise uh, uh, for the people who are already in uh, this meeting that um, it's a shame if uh, you have to wait too long. So welcome everybody. Good, good evening. Um, a number of you uh, are member of the Agile Consortium and know the Agile Consortium, but uh, a number of you all uh, are also new to the Agile Consortium. So let's just give a short introduction of myself and the Agile Consortium. Uh, I'm your host uh, tonight. My name is René Terhoeven. I'm one of the board members of the Agile Consortium. And next to that, I'm an Agile coach uh, at ING in the Netherlands. Um, the Agile Consortium is a Belgium and Dutch based uh, non-profit organization. And what we want to do, we want to spread and, and increase the knowledge of agility uh, uh, for all our uh, members. We do that by uh, events uh, like this uh, with our yearly conference, with uh, all kinds of workshops uh, we give every year. And next to that, we also have an uh, independent um, uh, certification uh, program uh, that we offer to everybody who wants to, uh, to, to get certified uh, in, on Agile in the broad uh, sense. Uh, tonight, I don't know if they already joined, I want also to specially welcome our Italian uh, uh, visitors. Um, in Italy, uh, we are starting up a new chapter of the Agile Consortium. Uh, so welcome uh, people from Italy uh, that are joining uh, tonight. Uh, next to that, I also want to uh, say that we have a number of other talks planned the coming period. Uh, May 17th, we have Gunther Verheiden, uh, we, who will talk about the values of Scrum. And June 2nd, we have uh, Linda Rising uh, talking about patterns while, while coaching leadership. And also June 2nd, we have also a new chapter of the Agile Consortium. Then Young Agile uh, has their first startup. And Young Agile is a special Agile initiative for people up to 35. If you want more information, please go to our website, uh, uh, follow us uh, on LinkedIn, and uh, we will, you will receive all the updates on everything we do. But now I want to switch to the topic of, uh, of this evening, uh, Rethinking Agile. So a very warm welcome for Klaus Leopold, uh, well known for his work in Kanban, and also, of course, his book, Rethinking Agile, in, uh, in what is the subject of uh, tonight. This session will be recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, I um, please shut off your camera because we want to uh, publish this session also via our website for the people who could not make it uh, this evening. The talk of Klaus will be approximately uh, 45 minutes. Uh, please keep your questions uh, for after the talk. You can post them in the chat. And after the talk, we have uh, 15 minutes or so Q&A uh, with Klaus, so we can ask him uh, even more. Um, I think that is uh, enough introduction. So uh, Klaus, uh, the, the floor is yours. Cool. Thank you, René, for the introduction. And good evening, everyone. Hello, hello. Um, Yes. Ah, I need to share my screen, right? Because then it's much easier to for you to see what I see. Here we go. You should see something, right? Yes, it's visible, Klaus. Perfect. All right. As René already said, uh, the title of uh, my talk today is Rethinking Agile. And the subtitle, spoiler alert, that's actually the message that I want to get across why Agile teams have nothing to do with business agility. And yeah, well, let's just start. All right, so um, I would like to share a story with you, a story about an organization. And this organization, well, they had some problems. They were in some troubles, right? So this organization um, was like, it takes way too long until we can deliver something to the market. So the time to market of their project was way too high. And uh, if you have a high time to market for your project, of course, other problems pop up, right? So for instance, 
um, they once were the leader in the market, but now they, they are no longer proactive. They are just reacting of what uh, competitors are doing. As they were the leaders, they actually still understand the market. They understand the customers. They know what to do. They see all the opportunities and everything. However, uh, it takes much longer to set up a project to address one of these opportunities and then the opportunity is already gone. And the other thing is like they were... You know, there's this continuous change going on. People are talking about Bitcoins, AI, and stuff like this. We no longer sell products. No, we don't. We no, no, we no longer do projects. We do products. We no longer do products. We do solutions. So there's this change going on all the time. And they were like, damn it. We need to fundamentally change the way how we are working. If we don't change the way how we are working, um, future will take place, but without us. If you are in a situation like this, what you do these days, it's easy. You become agile, right? Because with agility, you can address all these um, yeah, issues, actually. So, well, that's what they did. They decided to become agile, and they started an agile transformation program. Let me give you a very quick overview of uh, their agile transformation program. The very first thing was like, we need cross-functional teams. You know, we need to tear down these functional silos Functional silos are bad. We need as much knowledge as possible in one team so that this team can deliver directly to the market and we are totally light speed fast then. Cross-functional teams. They put it even one step higher and they were like, we need cross-functional product teams. This means one team is only working on one product. Again, you address a lot of dependencies and one team is working on one product delivering to the market and everything will be great. What else? Um, they were like, well, let's not be too dogmatic when it comes to the agile methods and frameworks, the teams they want to, what, what the teams want to use. They were like, teams can choose whatever they want. There are just some minimum requirements, what each and every team actually needs to incorporate in their uh, work. One is visibility. I mean, this is the agile consortium. I guess everybody knows uh, a lot about agile here. And one of the um, yeah, activities in all these Agile um, teams is a board. We want to see what's actually going on. And it makes sense in the end, right? Because uh, the idea was, okay, whenever there's a problem, you can just go to the team, go to the board, um, discuss the problem because we see it in front of us. What else? They were like, um, each and every team needs to do stand-up meetings, quick feedback loops so that we can um, yeah, quickly adapt on changing circumstances. Each and every team, there was another requirement, requirement needs to learn. So it's not a one-time thing, but we need to do this continuous improvement. And they were like, okay, each and every team needs to do retrospectives. And there's one more requirement, and I actually like this one. They were like, each and every team needs to do some measurements because we actually want to see if we're really making progress. So we need to measure speed, something like lead time, um, and we need to measure throughput, yeah? So how much are we delivering and how fast are we delivering? So this was basically the idea of uh, this Agile transformation. And if you've just read one Agile textbook, you probably think now, awesome. I mean, they really understand what to do, right? No matter which Agile textbook, that's exactly what you need to do in order to become Agile. Well, and that's what they did. Um, so how was the uh, transformation done? Well, the very first thing what they did is they set up a one and a half year transformation project. Can you feel something? I mean, this is this kind of humor that I, <laughs> I like, right? So we want to become agile. And the very first thing that pops up in our mind is, wow, let's build a big waterfallish plan with some Gantt charts and stuff, how we actually become agile. Well, I'm not sure if this is the right way of doing it, but we can talk about this a little bit later, okay? But this was actually their uh, kind of way of approaching it. Let's become agile, one and a half year transformation plan. What was um, part of this transformation plan? Well, the very first thing is, um, we're talking about 600 people roughly here, and all these 600 people, they need to receive some basic agile training. Because one thing is clear, agility is not so much about the practices. Agility is a lot about the mindset. We heard about the mindset, the agile mindset. So it's really important that all these 600 people, they really follow the right mindset. So what they did, they set up this 
one day agile mindset training. <laughs> and then, well, they could go to their transformation plan and like, yeah, agile mindset checked. Again, I'm not sure if this one day training of agile mindset is enough. Uh, maybe you need even two days for it. Um, but yeah, that, that, that was the idea. What else? Then uh, they carried out the reorganization. This basically means uh, all the people were thrown up in the air and they landed in cross-functional product teams. Then they implemented agility team by team. So it was basically rolled out. This means, um, yeah, all the scrum masters were trained and product owners and whatever we need, right? Um, in the beginning, this uh, whole initiative was supported by 16 external coaches which is really cool if you're running a consulting company. Um, yeah, so this is a lot of billable days, actually. But if you think of it, we are talking about 600 people. So if just 600 people need to do Scrum Master training, product owner training, we build campaign systems, we do design thinking, and so on and so on. So there's really a lot to do. But yeah, um, what else? They built up internal knowledge. I really like this one. So 11 internal agile coaches were also established. I mean, I think that's quite important because I've seen it so often. As long as the externals are here, the external consultants, everything is kind of okay. And when the externals are leaving, it's often like this. Oh, finally, we can switch back to normal, right? Um, but yeah, <laughs> you don't want to switch back to normal if you invest so much money here, right? So this was uh, the idea of how they are approaching their transformation. After roughly a year, they reported that 80% of the teams were fully transformed. I love this language. Re reminds me a little bit of the Borgs of Star, Borg, right? uh, Star Trek. Um, yeah, so 80% of the teams were fully transformed to Agile. What does this mean? Well. They could do quite a lot of these checks in their, in their project plan. Yeah, teams, they are doing these retrospectives. We have seen a board, stand-up meetings, and so on and so on. Check, 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 check. Teams are doing metrics. Metrics. Teams are measuring. Um, well, they were like, okay, so if they are measuring, so let's take a look. Um, are we actually improving? So um, they did a lot of measurements, right? I would just show you one measurement and this was actually the trigger of um, something needs to change actually. Let's take a look at one metric and this metric is time to market of the initiatives, initiative slash projects. So in their world, um, initiative is an agile world for uh, word for projects kind of. So um, the, the thing is, uh, the time to market of the initiatives of the projects was going up. And that's exactly the reason why they started this whole agile transformation, because they wanted to see something like this. They wanted to see the time to market uh, yeah, becoming, uh, going down and uh, they want to become faster. So this was the expected result. After 80% of all the teams were fully transformed, after a year, that was the actual result. The actual result was they were becoming slower, although they did all this agile magic. And then they were like, what the fiddlestick is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. I mean, we spent so much money in this whole agile transformation, and now it's getting worse. It takes even longer to deliver to the market. There's something totally wrong. And well, that's actually where they, where I come somehow into, into play. So they have seen me talk at, uh, at the conference where I was talking about you know, local optimization leads to global sub optimization and stuff like this. And they were like, hmm, well, maybe something like this is happening in our organization. So they basically invited me to join uh, the organization and have a look what was, what was going on. So I think I spent one and a half or two days uh, with them. And what uh, I did, I tried to search for the causes right in the beginning. So this was this one and a half to two days um, where I was like going around in the organization, having some conversations and just, yeah, draw a picture of what's actually going on. Um, the cool thing is in this organization, you could easily start a conversation with almost anyone because 
the work was really visible. Remember, um, in the beginning, they were like, okay, we need to make all our work visible. So it was quite easy to start a, a conversation about what, what's going on because we were seeing what's going on, right? So um, as agility was just a team thing in this organization, of course, I went to the teams. I went to the teams and yeah, stood in front of the board and had a conversation with them. And my first row of questions was about dependencies. So this is a very simplified visualization of a team board. So we have a backlog, which is like stuff we work on in the future. Next is like, okay, that's the stuff that's already committed to customers. We will start working on it soon. We are working on this stuff and done is done. So this is just like a sketch uh, for, for Scrum teams. It looked pretty much the same. So we have something like our product backlog here. Then we have our sprint backlog. That's the current sprint and then we're done, right? So this was one of these uh, visualizations. However, there was one thing going on. No matter which team I visited, there was always like an area like external waiting. Yeah? Do you know such external waiting things? So um, yeah, this team can no longer work on this work item because they are blocked because some other team needs to do something. Um, so what does this actually mean? So if you think of it, so here we are externally waiting. Let's assume really the entire organization, each and every team has a board. This means there needs to be a second board somewhere in our organization here for team two. And when something is blocked at team one, this means this creates demand for another team. This team is now doing some, I don't know, magic estimation, guesstimation, whatever. And whenever they come to the conclusion, okay, we will work on it, then they pull it in when it's done. This means, okay, team number one is unblocked and team number one can continue to work, right? So that's what's actually going on when uh, we see these, um, yeah, external waiting. So what I did now, I asked the teams, like, whom are you waiting for? And I drew a dependency chart. And this one looked like this. And... On this picture, we only see eight teams. Remember, we are talking about 600 people. So 600 people is a little bit more than only eight teams. And there are so many dependencies. But the question is, why are there so many dependencies? Remember, they built cross-functional product teams. That's, I mean, they built cross-functional product teams exactly to prevent situations like this, where we see a lot of dependencies. So why are there still so many dependencies? Well, multiple reasons. I give you the top three, at least from my point of view. Number one is, yes, um, they are working in product teams. This means one team is only working on one product. However, the point is that multiple teams are working on the same product, right? And if multiple teams are working on the same product, what a surprise, you have dependencies uh, between the teams, right? What else? The products were not completely independent. In their organization, it was like this. If you change something in this product, you need to change something in that product and they need to change something in the other product. So there were dependencies among uh, the products as well. And in the end, we're talking about 600 people. I personally have never ever seen an organization in knowledge work with more than 30 people without dependencies. So in the end, it's just clear that we see dependencies, right? And whenever I think of dependencies, there pops up a picture in my mind a picture of a keyboard. Let's assume our organization is a keyboard and we are in the writing business. So we write, we write letters, right? Now there comes, uh, let's organize our organization, right? So this is team one, team two, team three, and team four. Team one is only pressing the number keys, team two is pressing Q, W, E, R, team three, A, S, D, F, and so on and so on. So these are our teams. And now there comes the customer and the customer wants us to write a love letter. So now we need to think of, okay, how can we actually deliver this love letter, right? In an organization with 600 people, your keyboard looks pretty much like this. For each and every key on your keyboard, you have a team who is responsible of, of pressing this key, right? So we have a U team, we have an I team, we have an O team. Each and every organization, of course, needs an A team. Without A team, you're basically screwed. Um, yeah, and now let's assume we are optimizing all these teams and let's assume it's working. 
we have the best G team on this planet. We have the best D team. And when the E team starts to press the E button, smoke is coming out of the keyboard, right? Finally, we have high performing teams. How much faster can we deliver our letter to the customer? Not so much, right? <laughs> so the point is when it comes to operating on a keyboard, it's not so important that I'm able to press each and every key totally fast, right? Uh, when it's about writing a letter, it's way more important that I press the right key at the right time, right? So it's way more important that I press the right key at the right time. And this speeds up uh, my delivery of the letter. And the same is true for organizations. In organizations, it's not, it's not so important that each and every team is, is like working like light speed, right? Um, I never understood the concept of high-performing teams, uh, teams, by the way. In organizations, it's also way more important that we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. If we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time, we can deliver our stuff way faster to the market, right? And there's a gentleman called Russell Eckhoff who already said that the performance of the system is not the sum of its parts. It's the product of its interactions. It's not the sum of its parts. It's the product of its interactions. What does this mean if we transfer this to um, the agile world? In the agile world, we could say, well, agility of an organization is not about having many agile teams. Organizational agility means that we are having agile interactions between the teams. We need to make the interactions between the teams agile. And it's not so important that we have agile teams. Agile teams are awesome. Don't get me wrong, right? But it's way more important in a scaled context that we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. That's what we will call um, agile interactions. And in this organization, what we are talking about, they didn't care about agile interactions. They were like, we need to tear down our functional silos. We need to have these cross-functional teams and then everything will be great. Well, what they did, yes, they teared down the functional silos. But as a result, what they got is cross-functional silos. So uh, the point is, it's not so important how your team structure looks like. Of course, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of, of uh, cross-functional teams. But uh, the real enemy when it comes to organizational agility is not the team structure, it's the wall between the teams. So the point is we need to drill interactions, uh, interaction holes between these walls. We need to target the walls. There will be always uh, walls. There will be always silos, no matter how you reorganize your organization. So let's learn first how to establish actual interactions between the silos, between the teams. And then, um, yeah, let's talk about the rest. And this is something, these actual interactions, this was totally not on the radar in this organization. No actual interactions at all. So this was cause number one. I have three causes for you, and then I will switch to the, I'm not so good in time, sorry. I will speed up now a little bit. Um, uh, I have three causes for you. So let's stay a little bit in the problem domain and let's switch to the solution domain a little bit later. Uh, what else? Um, the next thing I was talking about with the people uh, in the teams is about the workflow. So the house work actually flowing through their system. So let's get back to their board. Remember, that's how these boards looked like. Now, I was challenging this flow here. Am I actually seeing everything here? So my questions were like, okay, you're developing, great. And then you're done. This means the customer is totally happy after development. And they were like, well, wait, no. It's not so easy in our organization. Of course, we're developing, but after development, we need to wait until uh, it's been integrated. So I'm like, okay, so there's some integration going on. I mean, that's the whole point why we have this uh, visualization here. So let's come up with another column. It's like waiting for integration, perfect. But now everything is integrated and you're done, happy, and everything's great. Uh, well, no, uh, after integration, we need to do acceptance testing. Okay, cool. Let's come up with another uh, column. So waiting for acceptance. And after acceptance, now the customer said, okay, I'm totally happy. Now you're done. 
And they were like, mm, almost, uh, but you know, we have these release windows and it needs to fit into one of these release windows and yeah, then we are done. All right, that's good information to have, right? So remember, they wanted to improve time to market of the projects. That's all time to market, right? And the cool thing is, if we see this, we can continue to ask questions. So my questions were like, okay, that's cool. Now we see it. So how long does it take? And they were like, well, integration we're doing on a monthly basis. And well, on a quarterly basis, we are doing the acceptance test and the release. We want to improve time to market of our projects. I guess we've, we've just discovered some more uh, levers that we could pull, right? But I wasn't happy here. So one thing is uh, the downstream. We have a lot of answers, especially in IT here. We know continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous everything, right? But uh, what's going on actually before we even enter this system here? So here we have a backlog. This means my, my, my question was like, okay, so here's your awesome product idea and then you start developing. And they were like, no, 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 wait, this is just a development backlog. Before we start to develop, of course, we need to do some analysis work. Okay, perfect. So let's come up with some more columns. I mean, that's the reason why we have these boards, right? So we have a product backlog, then we do some analysis work, we're in the uh, development backlog, and then we start. So in the product backlog, there's your great product idea, and then everything will be fine. And they were like, mm, well, yeah. Well, actually, our process looks more like this. We have a pool of new ideas, right? Then we are doing a first rough triage of these ideas. Um, all who pass this, uh, yeah, we write a, a rough business case, right? It's just a rough business concept. Uh, uh, then this business concept must be approved by a committee. Uh, those who get passed, then we write a detailed business case. And this is again, waiting for approval, approval. And then we are in the product backlog. Okay, so if we zoom out now a little bit, the process actually looks like this. And as I said before, the cool thing is if we have a visualization like this, we can again ask, okay, that's interesting. So how long does it take? And the answer was like this. On a monthly basis, which is actually quite fast in this context, they're doing the triage of new ideas. On a quarterly basis, four times uh, a year, they are approving new um, yeah, rough concepts. And on a yearly basis, they are um, yeah, thinking about um, their detailed business cases on a, yearly, uh, on a yearly basis. If we take a look at this process here, um, and if we want to improve time to market of our projects, um, I have some ideas what we could do, right? <laughs> so they also had some ideas. They were like development problem discovered. Let's blow some agile fairy dust in, in here, make them all agile and we're so fucking agile. We're just the most agile company on this planet. Well, um, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, I don't think so, right? So um, if you just make this teeny tiny wheel here spin faster in this whole value stream, you won't see a lot of results actually in the end, right? So, I mean, this is maybe agile software development. Fair enough, everything's great, right? But this has nothing to do with business agility. This has nothing to do with business agility. This organization acts lame on the market like before. There's no change actually, right? So yeah, and this was uh, my uh, problem number two that I discovered in this organization. They did totally not focus on end-to-end -end flow, which just a teeny tiny part of the process and uh, this was it. So problem number two, I have one more problem for you and then we switch to the solution domain, okay? Let's talk a little bit about the strategic portfolio. Um, yeah, let, let's make this short, um, but it's still interesting. So um, the strategy deployment process, okay? Um, let's draw a timeline. Timelines are always important. So in this organization, um, they approach strategy work like this. So what you could see in this organization that people were working on stuff, which is cool because that's the reason why the people are here and that's the reason why they get some money, right? So people were working on stuff. Then there was the strategy announced. 
Yeah, there was this day in the year where the strategy was announced. And the result of this strategy announcement was that people continued to work on stuff. I mean, that's why they're here, right? But then there was this end of year coming closer. So you could see the end of year sign already. And this triggered some behavior in this organization. What was going on when they saw this end of year sign is that more and more people created new PowerPoint documents, like strategy fulfillment.bptx, right? And what they did, they started to backward map the stuff what they were doing to the strategy. So they were like, ah, oh, we were working on this project. Well, this fits into this strategy bucket. We were working on this. Well, this fits probably into this strategy bucket. That's digitalization. Everything is mixed up digital, right? So um, they were doing a backward mapping of, um, of the work, what they have done uh, to the strategy. And that's exactly not what strategy is about, right? Strategy should determine what's going on in the organization. So um, to, to, to cut this story a little bit, there was totally no agile strategic portfolio management going on in, in this organization. And this was also a problem, especially when it comes to, to uh, strategic alignment, of course. So this was cause number three. Um, of course, there were some more causes, but um, let's say these were the most important uh, causes, right? No agile interactions between the teams, no end-to-end -end flow, and no agile strategic portfolio. So these were like the causes, which um, the causes of the problem that they were so late. Um, the question is, what are solutions now? So um, yeah, let's talk about some solutions. Let's talk about the first solution, which was like the um, actual interactions. Remember, in this organization, um, we had the problem that there were these. Um, uh, cross-functional product teams, agile product teams, but there were still so many dependencies. So what did we do to overcome this problem? We built product boards. What does this mean? We basically zoomed out from the team level, we identified what are multiple teams working on, and we built a board for this. So the point is, Multiple teams were working on the same product, if you remember, and that's the reason why we had these dependencies. So we identified what team is actually working on which product. So let's assume these three teams, they are working on, on this product. So what we basically did is we locked these teams into a room for a day and we were like, okay, figure out how you guys collaborate, how you work together and come up with a visualization, come up with a board, which illustrates how you are working, working together. And that's what we did for um, all the products actually. So the point is when you build something like team boards, you're optimizing the organizational structure. But I, as a customer, I'm totally not interested in your, in your org structure. I'm interested in value delivery. So what we did is we identified where are we delivering value to our customers and we built boards and organized the teams around this board where value delivery actually happens, right? And uh, the point is, um, if you do something like this, um, the board itself does not solve any problem, of course. The board is a dead object. What you need to do is you need to make sure that the right people are talking about the right stuff at the right time. So we established actual interactions across multiple teams. So what we did is we uh, established stand-up meetings on a product level. This means multiple teams or representatives for multiple teams were meeting in front of a product board and they were having a regular standard meetings. We did the same with retrospectives. So I see it in so many organizations that all the teams are doing retrospectives and each and every team is learning, but we don't learn together. So here we basically learn together across um, the product stream. And if you do something like this, the number of unmanaged dependencies goes down right? Because these dependencies, they are now being managed within or with the teams. Um, but there are still some dependencies remaining. Um, remember, uh, we had pro uh, dependencies between the products. If you change something in this product, you also need to change something in another product. So the products were not completely independent. What did we do to address this topic? 
Well, uh, we zoomed out a little bit more, and this means we established something what I would call today an operational portfolio. This means um, we basically identified what product or what are the dependencies between the products. And most of the time, we build another board, and this is just a sketch, what you see here. And on this board, you could see product one, product two, product three. So we had these dependencies, uh, we had the, the yeah, we had the dependencies between the products visible. And um, we again established agile interactions across this operational portfolio. Uh, so the, the products sent representatives and we were having portfolio stand-up meetings. And we were also having portfolio retrospectives. This means we were also learning across products, not only, so we were learning within the team, across the teams and across products, yeah? Um, yeah, and this is actually how we um, addressed uh, the, the point of um, dependencies uh, across these many teams. Then there was another problem. Remember the end-to-end -end flow. This was this huge process, this huge long process where it takes uh, until forever to deliver something to the market. So what did we do to overcome this issue? Well, if I show you the solution, it's easy. But in the end, it took roughly a year to get to this point um, because it looks easy, but it's quite uh, difficult to get there. But uh, just to summarize it, what did we do? Well, we simplified the upstream. Remember, there were a lot of steps before. Now there's only being a rough concept. This is waiting for approval. And then we can already start. And we brought business on board. We brought business on board, um, some, some context for this organization. Let me put it that way, they did not grow up with computers. So in, in, it was like, okay, this was business and then there was IT and this was a different group of people. And from the point of view of business, IT was just costing money and uh, yeah, not so good. And what we did is we brought them really on board. So we connected IT and um business in this board and they were having a, co uh, um, a communication across the entire value uh, delivery stream. So this was really not an easy task uh, to do. Um, but the thing is um, we could deliver much faster to the market because this we were collaborating with business. We only need a rough concept. So we did not invest so much money into paper. We invested more money in delivering value to the customer. And even this approval process was done on a monthly basis. But of course we needed to keep our limits here. So whenever something was shipped to the market then we could start something new. So it was not like, okay, we could add more and more stuff to the system. There was always this um, stop starting, start finishing mentality. So we always needed to finish something before we could start new stuff. And if you have something like this in place, this is really like, um, it's a treasure. <laughs> it's really good uh, if you can connect business and IT across the entire value creation. Uh, chain. And when I say connect, this means, well, we invited them to our agile interactions. So uh, remember, we, we did the stand up meetings and retrospectives. And now even business re representatives showed up at the stand up meetings and they showed up at the um, retrospectives. And that's how we actually dealt with the end to end flow. This was. Uh, yeah, solution number two. Now let's go to solution number three about the agile strategic portfolio. Remember, this was this backward mapping that was going on. What we actually did is we did a forward mapping out of it. What does this mean? Um, usually there is a goal, a goal that an organization wants to achieve. And we build a strategy of how to achieve this goal, right? And what we next did, Okay, this is our strategy, how we get to this goal. We want to enter, I don't know, the Latin American market uh, is our goal and we build a strategy how to get there. We build a strategy, out of the strategy, what we did is we derived outcomes and concrete actions, what we need to do uh, to get, uh, to fulfill the strategy actually. So the strategy was the source which actually generated 
um, the actions. And then we measured the outcome, like, okay, are we really getting closer to this or not? And this triggered a learning loop and maybe it refined uh, the strategy. So this was our forward loop. There was no longer a backward mapping or justification going on. I'm working on this project kind of, right? And if we just drew, draw this cycle a little bit different, we can already see a strategy board. So let me just draw this circle a little bit different, right? So let's assume we have our three to five years uh, strategy items here. Um, what we did is we derived outcomes like uh, what do we need to, to do or what can we actually do within a year, right? So the point is, uh, yeah, it's cool that in three to five years we want to, I don't know, conquer China, but what does this mean for the next year, right? So what, what are the outcomes that we can achieve in the next year? If we know the outcomes in the next year, we were like, okay, what does this mean for the next uh, 90 days? So for the next quarter, what can we achieve in the next quarter? Um, so this is like how we more or less broke down the outcomes. And then we were like, okay, now we, we, we broke basically down the, the strategy item to 90 days items. When you are at 90 days items, what we did, we derived concrete actions of what we need to do. So action is like, um, yeah, we need to build something, right? And this is just like the definition of what we want to achieve. And if you see something like this, I can already see a strategy board. We just need to add some lines and we just need to remove some other lines and we have a strategy board. And this could be a rough sketch of how the strategy board uh, looked like. So um, we have our strategy items here. Then we have measurable outcomes and the measurable outcomes, they're moving on a scale. Like we achieved 50% or 70% uh, of this outcome. And this is the concrete actions that we are taking in order to achieve these outcomes. And this is just a very rough overview here. We are not started in flight or we are at measure success. So this means we are almost done with it. So what, what, what we did actually, we created focus by closing the time funnel. And that's totally important uh, in organizations. It's really hard to do uh, a prioritization of these strategy items. Let's assume the strategy item is uh, enter the Asian market and strategy item number two is digitalization. What is more important? I cannot prioritize this. I just know in three years, we need to have all of this stuff. So I, I cannot prioritize it. Everything is totally important, right? But if we ask, okay, cool. In three years, we want to have all this stuff, but what can we achieve until next year? This means we're narrowing the funnel a little bit. And just by asking this question, what can we achieve next year? We need to, um, yeah, let go of some stuff, right? We cannot do everything of three years in just one year. And if we ask again, okay, and what does this mean for the next 90 days? Again, we need to, we need to focus. We need to say, okay, for the next 90 days, we can work on this stuff. And if you are on 90 days items, then you can start to prioritize. So that's really important when it comes to like your strategy board, you need to narrow the time funnel down because you cannot uh, prioritize uh, three years or five years uh, strategy items. And that's the way of doing it. And that's a way of creating focus for the entire organization. And yeah, so this was the strategy board that we came up. And of course, we were having actual interactions in front of this uh, strategy board. Um, just two representatives here, which were more or less the most important ones. We were having stand-up meetings and also retrospectives um, in front of the uh, strategy board. And just as a side note, we were having stand-up meetings on a weekly basis in front of the strategy board. Because often people think, okay, let's do a stand-up meeting once a quarter. Mm, yeah, we can talk about this a little bit later. Uh, that doesn't make so much sense, right? All right. Um, yeah, so these were uh, the solutions. What we basically did, we established action interactions between products uh, and teams. We established end-to-end -end flow and we brought business on board. And we established um, an agile strategic portfolio where also the most important uh, stakeholders were meeting in front of this board on a regular basis and discussing um, yeah, what's going on. And what we actually do, well, 
we applied flight levels thinking um, in order to solve these problems. Um, what is flight levels? What is flight levels uh, thinking? So actually everything for all the solutions, it was not like, okay, we need to do the solutions. We always applied, let's say a thinking model and the thinking model helped us to solve the problem. And that's what we would call uh, the flight level. So flight levels uh, is not like a method or a, flame or a framework. Flight levels is more like a tool, a thinking model, which helps you to understand uh, where in an organization you have to do what in order to achieve the result that you want to achieve, yeah? So uh, when you're doing flight levels, what you're doing is you're applying five activities on three levels. What are the five activities? Uh, activity number one is visualize the situation. I've shown you a lot of uh, visualizations, visualize your situation, right? Second activity in uh, flight levels is that we want to create focus. The point is we want to shift our thinking from starting work to finishing work, right? Because starting work costs money, finishing work brings money. So it doesn't make any sense to start more and more work and spend more and more money without finishing work. This means earning money. Stop starting, start finishing is uh, a slogan that we hear quite often here. Uh, but the whole point is really about shifting uh, the mindset from starting work uh, to finishing work. That's what we mean when we say create focus. Uh, but creating focus is, uh, yeah, that's what we mean with create focus. Um, what else? Uh, activity number three is um, we established actual interactions. Actual interactions means that the right people talk about the right stuff at the right time. Yeah. Um, so communication is important. Then uh, measure progress. Um, measure progress is also actually very important. This means um, when you're doing flight levels, or let me put it that way, doing flight levels for the sake of doing flight levels is quite unsexy. We hopefully want to achieve something with it, right? And the question is, uh, if you want to achieve something with it, um, we could ask the question, okay, and how do we know that we are getting closer to it? How do we know that we are on the right track? So we set up a metric actually, which tells us, are we on the right track? So we measure progress when we do flight levels. And activity number five is we improve. And to improve basically means you start over and over again. You modify your visualization, you create focus and so on and so on. So these are the five activities that you're doing when you're doing flight levels. Um, when you are applying these five activities, the outcome is most likely something like this. That's a board with a lot of um, like policies and stuff around. And yeah, so now the important thing is what's, I mean, if, if, if I take a look at these five activities, what's new? I mean, uh, this maps totally fine to Scrum, for instance. We have our Scrum board, create focus, we are doing sprints, uh, we have our burn down chart. So uh, Scrum fits perfectly in there. Uh, Kanban fits perfectly in there. Uh, design thinking fits perfectly in there. Um, yes, and the idea is um, the five activities, they are method agnostic because there's one important thing. You need to apply these five activities on three different levels in your organization. And these are the flight levels. So it's not about um, applying these five activities isolated in your organization. You need to apply it on three different levels. And that's what we did in this organization. So um, what is flight levels, uh, the term? The term flight levels tells you how high an aircraft is flying, right? On a high, uh, and uh, yeah, that, 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 that's what the word is about. And um, the point is, it's not about better or worse. So a higher flight level is not better than a lower flight level. I see different things, right? When I, when I fly very low, I see a lot of details. I see cars, I see, I see human beings, everything. But my vision is somehow restricted. If I fly very high, I see a lot of the landscape and everything, but I don't see so much details. And the same is true for organizations. In organizations, we can also fly very low where we see a lot of details and we can fly very high. Uh, if we fly very low in an organization, we are at flight level one. Flight level one is the operational level. Operational level means a team that is, that is actually doing the work, right? Um, yeah. 
usually, uh, and the idea is that we apply these five activities on our teams in our organization. The five activities that I've just uh, talked about, right? Usually an organization has more than only one team. So we see multiple flag of one systems in our organization. Um, most of the time, it's the case that one team alone cannot deliver a value to the customer. So multiple team needs to coordinate so that they can deliver value to the customer. This means we need to fly a little bit higher. This would be flight level two. Flight level two is about end-to-end -end coordination. Flight level two makes sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time, right? This means we're connecting this flight level two, the coordination level with the teams. And now here, we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And the cool thing is from the point of view of flight level two, we actually don't care about how the teams are performing their work. So we don't care about methods, for instance. We don't care if, if, if teams are doing Scrum or if they are doing Kanban or if they are just working, that's also fine, right? So we just make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. That's the world of your products, of your services, everything that's great for the customer. Usually an organization has more than only one product or one service. So we see multiple flight level two systems in our organization. And again, we need to identify these flight level two systems and we need to apply the five activities on each of these uh, flight level two systems. Make your work visible, create focus, establish action interactions, measure progress and improve on all these flight level two systems, right? Um, most of the time we also have dependencies between our products and services. So we could solve this also on a flight level two, we just bring them closer together and build an operational portfolio. Now we can um, apply again the five activities on multiple products and services uh, at the same time. Now we can manage um, across products and services. This is flight level two. It's actually one of the most important flight levels. And we can fly a little bit higher, which is flight level three. And then we are at the strategy level. Strategy means what we are doing is we are aligning the entire work in the organization to the strategy and we create focus here uh, on the strategy level. And again, we are connecting the flight level three to the flight level two and to the flight level one systems. And also on the strategy level, we are applying the five activities. We visualize the situation and so on and so on. And these are the... Uh, three flight levels. So the idea is what we basically did in this organization, we identified their flight level one, two, and three systems. And then we started to apply these five activities on all these flight level one, two, and three systems. And the result was all the solutions that I've just shown to you before. All right, one final thought, and then we're done. If we take a look at something like this, Mm, and hopefully this came across in, in the story that I told you. Whenever I think of, of this, one thing for me is clear. When it comes to business agility, then business agility is definitely not a team sport. Business agility is a company sport. You need to identify your operational levels, your coordination levels, your strategy levels, and you need to apply agility on all these levels, you need to connect all your agile islands in your organization. You need to connect all your operational teams. And this is what business agility um, is about in the end. All right, that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, just a quick one. If you're interested in this topic, um, there's the Flight Levels Academy. Uh, we are building a lot of workshops and stuff around this. And there is a so-called Flight Levels uh, Introduction course. That's an online course, a self-paced learning course. And there's also a check-in included, like a live check-in with me and Cliff Hazel, my uh, co-founder of the Flight Levels Academy. And if you enter AC 2021, you get 10% off um, for the Flight Levels Introduction course. Cool. That's everything I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Klaus. It was very enlightening. Um, so now there's room for, for q and uh, I don't, didn't see during the talk, everybody was listening to heart, I think, uh, no questions in the chat. Um, if you allow me, I, uh, I have one question to kick it off. Um, in your talk and also in your book, you mentioned a quote by uh, Russell Eckhoff. 
uh, mm. where uh, Russell uh, uh, discussed and, and made his whole, one of his um, uh, points in, in his research was that uh, you have to look at the whole and to the interactions of all the different parts. But are there any uh, more ideas or viewpoints uh, from uh, operational research or, or uh, uh, management science that you think uh, we uh, should consider or um, keep in mind while doing uh, agile transformations? Ooh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very big question. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the answer, <laughs> the, answer <is> for sure, <laughs> the answer is for sure yes, but I mm -hmm. cannot uh, come up from the top of my head now with some uh, really like OR. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. I, I, I <laughs> that doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm just a fan of Russell Eckhoff. And so I was wondering <laughs> if you use more of his work. Uh, is this really, I mean, this is actually not from a book from him. I saw this quote mm -hmm. in one of his fabulous talks so he was mm. always speaking without any slides and anything yes. but just standing in front of a crowd and 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 really in the, talking about an inspiring uh, story and i picked it, this this quote uh, up on on one of his talks really maybe it's it. also the case because most of his talk were, were pre powerpoint uh, uh, <laughs> exactly yeah so maybe that's why they <laughs> were very good late 70s early 80s or so yes right? exactly yeah <laughs> Okay, um, I see here a question uh, from uh, from uh, Patrick Heller. Uh, Patrick, maybe you can uh, just go off mute and uh, and ask your question to uh, to Klaus. Yes, uh, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, good. My question was, um, why? Who do you involve in the stand-ups and retrospectives on the different levels, and mm -hmm. are they always the same people? Thanks for this question. Very, very important question. Um, so um, there, there, there are multiple answers to this question. So I think one thing is, is important before I, I, I go into, in, uh, before I answer this question, because that's why I like this question so much. So um, flight levels looks like a hierarchical kind of thing, right? So we have the captains up here like the C level, then we have the middle management and then we have the people who are doing the work. But that's exactly not the case. Flight levels is not a, a mapping of your org chart. We are mapping your, uh, your operational structure. And in the idea of flight levels, it's like this. On flight level one, multiple teams are working, but then they discover, oh, we have dependency. So we cannot deliver our operation is not perfect to the market. So these teams, they built a flight level two system. So the flight level two system is not the system of some managers or something like this. The flight level two system is the system of the teams. And then we have multiple of these flight level two systems. And then they were like, oh, wow, it probably would make sense that we align strategically. So representatives of the flight level two, which are representatives of the team, built the flight level three system, right? So flight levels actually, uh, could work without any hierarchies. So it's not a hierarchy, hierarchical model. And this is also part of, uh, of the answer to your questions, of your questions. So what we usually do is we send representatives from the teams to the flight level two standup meetings and we send representatives from our flight level two standup to the flight level three. And to the second part of your question, I'm a huge fan that this is not always the same person. I would like to rotate this uh, into, uh, yeah, to, to, to multiple persons from the team because often it's quite easy. If I see my team garden, everything is fine, right? And all the others are stupid kind of. But if you join a flight level two standup meeting, you represent your team in a group of um, 200 people or something like this, right? So this really helps you to see uh, the entire forest of, of the product and not only the part of your uh, team garden. So I'm a huge fan of rotating um, this. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for the question also. Um, Paul or Paulus Meis, uh, you also asked a nice question. So, so maybe you can uh, ask a question to, uh, to Klaus. Hello. Uh, hi, Klaus. But, uh, hi. Um, uh, what I see is uh, for, for, uh, the impression I get is a general scheme to 
uh, for uh, agile scaling. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of uh, methods, uh, where some are more familiar to me than the others. Um, and I see a lot of uh, things that are, seems to be common. Uh, are you agree? And if so, uh, do you say, well, um, uh, it applies, uh, you, you have more familiarity to some methods or what, what is your opinion? Mm. Yeah. Um, I would actually agree that it's a way of uh, scale agility in an organization, but it's actually... I have a little bit of a problem of the word scale because we, so the idea of flight levels is not, is not there are the teams and then we need to scale it to somewhere else. We always target the entire organization and we always try to, by thinking in the three uh, levels, we don't do isolated uh, like optimizations. We always try to optimize the whole system as one thing. So it's not like scaling, like there are two teams and we have 300 teams. So we need to make them uh, agile. And I think that the difference mm, to other- I think that you say. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, if you just, well, let me concentrate on the word scaling, then you might think like that, but uh, the, the methods say a bit more than just that. So, yeah. Uh, and uh, exactly just, the sort of problems you, 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 you mentioned, uh, they uh, take into account more or less, some more bureaucratic like uh, safe or yeah. less bureaucratic like less. Uh, that was the, the second part I, I wanted oh, to add. So uh, this, this is my understanding of scaling, right? That, that, that's the first thing. And the second thing is, I think um, the difference between flight levels and scaling models is um, that there is no recipe in flight levels. In flight levels, it's really like you have these five activities and you have three levels. There are no roles. There are no like concepts like this it's really it's more like a thinking model and each and every flight levels um implementation looks different because we always start with one thing and this is like okay what do we want to achieve and based on this what we want to achieve we apply everything a little bit different so you don't have like a predefined recipe or framework that you're installing you just have three levels and you need to think on these three levels on and the five activities and this is different with many scaling frameworks as far as i know them yeah okay. but i'm not a, i'm not an i'm not a scaling framework yeah, specialist yeah, i, I can <laughs> understand what you mean uh, then then it is different uh, for instance for, for shape that is describes a, a lot of things and more about roles it describes a lot of things but it is then more in in, in the, the the mindset of less for instance would also say well just uh, take Scrum and the, the ideas, the mindset, your activities, for instance, and apply them on, on, on multiple levels. So, okay. If this is the case? <laughs> well, well, well yeah, I am simplifying things, but uh, just like you say, um, you, you have also that you say you have multiple uh, possibilities of, of better, unless you will always preferably use Scrum in uh, every level. Yeah. Uh, you say you can use your, your preferred method with, with whatever you want. So that's that's a bit more general, if I understand yeah. you correctly. Maybe one more thing I would like to add. Uh, I think if you want to act Agile on the market, um, it's very important that not all teams use Agile methods. So for instance, uh, oh. Amazon is a good example. Amazon, I mean, nobody can cannot say that Amazon is not... Uh, when it comes to business agility, I mean, you can think of uh, Amazon, whatever you like, but when it comes to business agility, this bookshop is not so bad, right? So <laughs> they run multiple businesses these days, right? So business agility is really great. And what you see within Amazon is there are some agile teams. Yes, fair enough. But you see Lean Six Sigma black belts running around uh, and everything. So the point is, uh, or for instance, if you are an infrastructure organization, if you are, I don't know, a, a pilot uh, in an airline, I don't want to have agile pilots, right? So they don't, hopefully they don't do a sprint planning. Oh, I need to fly to, I don't know, Paris these, uh, today. How can we do it? Should I put on some gas or, I mean, we know how stuff is working, right? And I think that's the point uh, when it comes to business agility. 
uh, it's not about agile each and everywhere. It's about agility of the organization. And the agility of the organization is composed of some parts that need to act agile, where we have a high degree of uncertainty, and other parts who don't have to be, be agile, actually, because agile would hinder them. And that's the reason why I'm a little bit like, well, I'm not sure if all teams should do Scrum in an organization or use uh, the Scrum kind of method. But as I said, I'm not an expert on scaling methods. That's that's the other thing. No, but I can understand, yeah. So for, for instance, you have, well, a bit simplification again, uh, the bi-model model, model uh, you may probably have heard. You say, well, you have stable systems, just, uh, do it on, on the on a um, stable way and in the innovative parts of your, your company use indeed the uh, agile methods where you have to react uh, quickly i i get the, the the sense of that yeah um klaus do you have time for uh, another question sure uh jeroen you did also ask a question uh, in the in the chat Yes, yeah, and I think it, it's related to the questions, uh, the two questions above, because um, looking at the, the scaling frameworks uh, where uh, uh, Paulus is, is referring, um, and you, you see the, 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 uh, the, the forming of uh, release trains or tribes uh, collecting the teams and also having uh, the dependencies within that. Uh, but what I usually see is, uh, and that's connecting to the first question, uh, who's participating at the different levels? Uh, usually in the frameworks, you see the, the layers uh, in there. Uh, you have the, the product owners, the chief product owners, and you connect uh, the traditional managers towards uh, shifting in product owners or chapter leads. Um, so my question is about that relation to the management. And I was wondering, because first I thought at the, at the highest level, at the strategic level, uh, that who's setting that strategy? Uh, if, when you say the participants at the strategic level are still representatives of the teams, uh, then who's setting the strategy? It feels like the risk of having a, a, a wall between uh, the, the board of directors or whoever is, is, uh, is connecting to the strate strategy and uh, the rest of the organization. So can you elaborate on how you connect those two? Mm -hmm. I mean, who is who is defining the strategy, right? Yeah. Who is responsible for coming up with the strategy? I mean, that's, that's the classical answer. It depends. I'm just thinking of multiple, yeah. uh, of multiple uh, examples. So I know one uh, telco organization in, in Germany. Um, it's a, just a small telco with roughly 300 people. Um, and here they basically have very flat hierarchies. They basically have two hierarchies. One is like people and the other one is like the owners. And this is like the, like from, from German uh, law, you need to have something like a Geschäftsführer uh, who is more or less responsible on paper for it. So in this organization, uh, strategy is uh, yeah, defined by a, a group across uh, the entire organization, including the owners. So that's one extreme. The other extreme is um, you can also see like, okay, we know what's best for the organization and we uh, more, or like, more or less prescribe the strategy. So um, this is nothing, so flight levels doesn't tell you how this should work. But the point is when we do something like a flight level systems architecture, um, flight level systems architecture basically tells us what are our, our, our flight level one, two and three systems. And then we do flight routes. Flight routes means how is work flying through uh, the organization. So you see the, the three flight levels, and then you see how work is flying across the flight levels. And when you are mapping these flight routes and you only see routes like this, so work starts somewhere up here and is going down into the organization, this triggers conversations. This basically means there are very smart people up there who exactly know what the rest of the, of the organization has to do. Is this our understanding how we would like to approach this or not? And then it depends on the flight levels coach actually to trigger this conversation and to lead it to somewhere. Does this somehow make sense? And if we see flight routes like this, this means we are taking 
the organization up to flight level three and all their knowledge, we take a decision there and then work goes uh, down in the organization again. That's a pattern what I would like to see if we have flight routes like this. And I also like to see something like this. So not everything has to be a strategic decisions. So we need to even let people do uh, the stuff. So this is actually two patterns that I want to see in flight routes. And if I don't see it, I, as a coach, need to trigger the conversation why I don't see it. I, I can imagine that and uh, when I hear you talk about this uh, and I envision the end state uh, of an organization where it's, it says a, a high autonomy uh, 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 with, with the teams that, that uh, see this as their own company and then, and then I see this taking place, but in a transformation, in your example, uh, uh, you come from a situation where you have the management, where you take them stepwise yes. towards become leaders and, and transform. Uh, so if you're not at the end state, uh, then, then there is a part in the organization that will define, uh, will, will, will create the alignment to, to, to also facilitate yeah. the autonomy. So, so getting from A to B, and my question is more on, on do you have an advice on how to transform into that direction? Yeah, um, I have. Um, I have another. I have another thing. I'm. I'm not a huge fan of A and B. I'm not a fan of an end state. We hopefully never ever at an end state because then we have lost. So um, the idea is more or less flight levels helps you see what's going on and it triggers um, discussions. So it's a gradual process. It's not, it's not a radical like, okay, we are here and then we need to do this and then we are in Nirvana and everything will be fine. It's more like we always continue, we uh, inspect and adapt. And this is also true for the change uh, process actually. And uh, because of this stepwise incremental approach, um, what, we, what we do is we can adjust the step length based on the culture and based on what's possible, if this makes sense. Yeah, but so, maybe maybe the, I re rephrase the question. Yeah, the, the board of directors for, for your example company, uh, what are they doing? What's their role in the company? In this particular company I was talking about, this was a very classical company. This was the board of director and they were responsible to come up with the strategy and everything. And how in the starting state. Still flight to flight level one, where the representatives of the teams were there. Was there a connection or was there a disconnect? In the beginning, there was a total disconnect. But what we did, we, we drew the, the, the flight level systems architecture and we especially drew the, the flight routes. And we could only see something like this. And then we were like, okay, is this our understanding? So are we really the smartest persons in, in, in this entire organization? And is this what we want to see? And then they, they started like, well, maybe not. And then we changed the behavior. So we modeled different, different flight routes. And this is a stepwise approach. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, but I, can, I can see how it can help to, to make them connect uh, yes. uh, with the teams, yeah, but I was wondering exactly. if if this was a thing that you you encountered, or or that it was, or, or that you don't, did not have that. Uh, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah, but the point is, you don't have a gold state. No, I I, I know, <laughs> and I agree with you. It's uh, it's the continuous improvement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. There are some comments in the chat, but I don't think there are any questions anymore. Of course, people will have questions all the time, but uh, if you want to mo know more about flight levels, thank you, Klaus, for, for giving us a, a discount and we can, uh, can, can look into it. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for, for this evening, for uh, listening and participating. Um, if you uh, want to have uh, more uh, evenings like this, uh, please check our website, uh, check our, our uh, LinkedIn profile. Uh, the next one is on May 17th, where Gunther Verheyen will talk about the value of Scrum. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and uh, hopefully uh, I see you again. Cool. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.